All right, good afternoon, everyone. So today, very special treat. Um, we have tres hermanos that are joining us today that are going to talk to us about Chicana Chicano music, all the way from the late 60s, early 70s to contemporary music, okay? So we're gonna um, change it up a bit today. Uh, feel free to put your dancing shoes on since you're home. You can just kick them off even if you feel like dancing, but um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, you all met Oscar de la Torre before. He came to um, speak to us before about uh, the political movements that were happening in the 1990s, if you all remember, okay? And he is running for city council in Santa Monica. So he's very busy with his um, campaign right now. So we're gonna have him go first because he has to go handle his campaign. Wishing you much luck with that, Mano. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce you since this is a new recording and some people may not have, um, the other one. I'm gonna go ahead and read your bio again, okay? So Oscar okay. was student body president at Santa Monica High in 1989 to 1990 and at California State University at Chico from 1994 to 1995. While at Chico State, Oscar organized against the anti-immigration Proposition 187 and the anti-affirmative action Proposition 209. While attending the University of Texas, Oscar co-founded Students for Access and Opportunity as a response to the elimination of affirmative action policies in Texas. After completing his MA degree in public affairs from the University of Texas, Mr. De La Torre returned to Santa Monica to serve his community. In November of 2002, Mr. De La Torre was elected as the youngest member to serve on the Santa, Ma Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District Board of Education. And in response to four gang related homicides and five shootings, Mr. De La Torre led community efforts to create the Pico Youth and Family Center. He served as executive director of PYFC for 20 years, and he's recently completed his term as president of the California Latino School Board Association and is currently running for city council in the city of Santa Monica. We're all wishing you much luck with that, hermano. So I'm going to go ahead and play that video and then you can get into your discussion, okay? Sounds great. Thank you. Sorry, let me unmute that. I'm gonna feel you. Yeah, the, vol the volume's a little low or off. Hold on now. Like two, three hours. Let me try that again. I think I missed a button when I wanted to share. Okay, here we go. Where's the stop share? It's not popping up for me. Can I can I start speaking? Yes. Okay. Meanwhile, you figure that out, right? Uh, well, thank you all, class. It's uh, always a pleasure being uh, here. Um, it's always great to see so many bright faces and everybody, um, you know, paying attention and learning. Even though we're doing this through the computer and the whole Zoom, you know, distance learning thing, and. Um, in any case, what you all just saw right now is what we have at the Pico Youth and Family Center. 
And I'll tell you a little bit of background on that. Um, we have a recording studio. We opened up the first public recording studio in the city's history uh, here in Santa Monica. And, and uh, the, 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 the person you saw making the beat, that's uh, Julian, Julian Ayala. Uh, he's a Salvadoreño. I uh, grew up here in Santa Monica and he learned about hip hop culture through the youth center. And then he's become a really good producer. And the DJ that you see scratching is a, 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 actually my childhood friend. His name is um, Carlos and uh, Carlos Maldonado, uh, AKA DJ Diablo. He, uh, he's been DJing since he was a kid. And the reason why we have a recording studio at the youth center is because when I, when I was a teenager, and there was a lot of, you know, gang and drug activity in my neighborhood. Hip hop culture is what saved us, what got a lot of us out of that. So we used to spend like all weekend making songs. And, um, you know, as Veronica was saying, I'm running for city council, but back when I was like 14, 15 years old, I was uh, writing lyrics and talking about, you know, what was going on in my neighborhood. And, and uh, it really kept us out, you know, of a lot of trouble because we were, we were recording songs, you know, and making music. And, and Carlos, that you saw DJing right there, he was the DJ, he would make um, the music. But back then there was no MPC drum machines or Pro Tools. Like now the technology has advanced enormously where you have a recording now, you can have a recording studio for like $25,000 that is just as good as like a recording studio like 10 years ago, you know? So, um, Hip hop culture is really important to, to the Latino community because Latinos are some of the, are, are the founders of hip hop culture, along with African-American brothers and sisters, you know, in the Bronx, New York. So in New York, um, you know, there's some really cool movies that you all should watch. There's one movie called uh, Wild Style, like Wild Style. If you check out that movie, Wild Style, it's like the first hip hop movie that I ever saw. Uh, there's another one that came out later. It's called Beat Street, uh, B-E-A-T, Beat Street. That's also a cool movie too, but it was more Hollywood. There's some other movies that I wouldn't even recommend because their other ones are pretty much trash. But those two movies are two of my favorite movies. Um, hip hop culture is born out of the ghetto. Let's just make that really clear that, you know, we talk about poor neighborhoods and low income neighborhoods, but, but uh, you cannot have hip hop culture without poverty. Like out of the out of the the struggle came this beautiful culture uh, called hip hop. Now, no one knows where the term hip hop came from. You know, a lot of people um, they theorize about it, but I, you know, like KRS One, who's one of my uh, favorite hip hop artists, he said uh, he said it best. He goes, "Hip hop came from the heavens." You know, it's a lot of a lot of people uh, don't know. Even the founders don't know where the term hip hop came from. But I like to, I like to use this term. I like to define it this way. Hip is uh, knowledge, right? Growing up, I mean, you all are younger. Maybe Sirenio remembers this. But when we were uh, younger, they would, we would say, hey, are you hip to this or get hip to that, right? Hip was always like knowledge in the streets. And then hop, for me, is action. So it's sort of like ethnic studies, you know? is get hip, get the knowledge, and then take action. Like do something with it, do something in your community. And um, there's various elements to hip hop culture. So what you saw right now was the DJing, right? So the scratching and the mixing, um, which is very unique because someone told me this, uh, that, that the turntable or what they call turntablism, scratching, mixing, all that, the turntable is like the only, the, the only American instrument ever invented that came from the United States of America. And it came from, from some DJs in the Bronx, New York. Um, some of the most recognized like DJ Kool Herc, you know, who started uh, getting break beats. So like you, you heard him scratching on, on this one sound. Now that sound was actually like from a, uh, a Chinese record. So what DJs do, they spend a lot of time, you know, going through all these records. Like I have right now like 300 records in my garage and I haven't really heard them all. I don't even know what I have down there. I have the Beatles and I have all kinds of crazy stuff. So what DJs do is they spend hours and hours and hours listening to records and they find this one sound that they like. Like in this case, you saw my friend grabbing that bam, bam, wow, 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 bam, bam, wow, wow, wow. It loops like that. So he grabs that and he's scratching on that and, and, and he makes a new, a, a new sound out of like 
an old record, he can make like a hip hop song, even like a Chinese record that people in China don't even know that some a Chicano in LA is using it to make a hip hop, you know, beat. So the elements of hip hop, uh, DJing, right, which is the, what you just saw, the turntablism, MCing, so somebody rapping on a mic, so you know, a hip hop, a hip to the hip. You guys remember all those songs? I don't think I know that song. And all the songs that we hear, even you know, all the rappers that we hear now, Two Chains, Fifty Cent, YG. I mean, we hear all the. What are all the? I mean, there's all these new guys. You know what I'm saying? Everything's little, little pump, little this, little that. Um, Todos those little littles. But anyways, um, those are the rappers, right? The MCs. MCing is one of the elements of hip hop. DJing is one of the elements of hip hop. Break dancing is one of the elements of hip hop. Now, the way I encountered hip hop was through pop locking, popping. So Los Angeles invented popping. So you guys know what popping is? Like, you know, like, man, 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 you know, all the, all the, all the, all the popping moves, right? That was popping. In New York, from the East Coast, they invented break dancing. So a lot of times people, they, they say break dancing and they include popping, but popping is the LA thing. In fact, the first time I saw a black kid on my street, like this kid, uh, cat, we call him, and he was popping. And I saw that and it, I was amazed. I was like, wow, it would look really cool. You know, like some of the stuff, some of the moves, you know, the moonwalk, for example. Um, like that, you know, Michael Jackson made the moonwalk uh, very popular, but that was like, that, so that's another element, right? The break dancing, uh, you have, you have um, the break dancing, the DJing, the emceeing and the graffiti art. In fact, I, I'm gonna show you something real quick. I have a... So this is on my desk right here. And everybody that loves graffiti has one of these. Can you guys see, see this? So like, I'll show you, I won't go into it, but I'll show you like, like stuff that, you know, graffiti art, you know, but I know you're all talking about music, but, but, but this is, um, this is real important to understand that, that hip hop culture has all the different elements and it all combines. So what you hear mostly is hip hop as rap music. You hear hip hop, Power 106, where hip hop lives. Hip hop don't live in a radio station because you can't put all the elements in the radio station. The break dancing, for example, you can't see it. The graffiti art, they don't even talk about it. So hip hop is a culture with all various elements. It's not just rap music. But specifically around rap music though, um, you know, the DJing is the foundation of it. You cannot have rap music without DJing. And the power of the DJ was grabbing break, what they call break beats. So there was a part in the, there would be a part in a record where it's just instrumental. And the DJ then grabs the instrumental beat and with two, turn, two turntables, he has two records that, are, that, play, that have the same instrumental, he can, he can continue that beat. So if like one record is going like, like boom, boop, bap, boom, boop, bap, right? Then he can just go to the other one and just go boom, boop, bap, 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 right? And that's how you make the beat. That was how the first uh, MCs, they had now an instrumental to rap on. So they were able to like, you know, do their lyrics, you know? Um, and um, so that's really the foundation of, of like, of, of, of hip hop culture and also like uh, rap music. Of course now, you know, people have all this technology, like at the recording studio, what, before it would take us a whole weekend to record one song because the DJ had to be perfect the rapper had to be perfect, the lyrics had to be right, everything was perfect. But now you can just cut and paste. So you can do the, the, the hook one time and then, and then on Pro Tools, you can just cut and paste it. So the technology has allowed uh, rappers and, and, and hip hop musicians to make music like in what would take you a whole weekend now, like in one hour, two hours. I've seen guys go into the vocal booth you know, and just do their thing. They, 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 they have their lyrics already memorized and the beat's already there, put on the headphones, they record a song. So um, the last thing I wanna say about, uh, cause how much time do we got left? We, we, uh, we're, we're... A couple minutes. Okay, a couple minutes. The, um, you know, hip hop music, which, what's really unique about it and why it, it will never die out is because you can turn anything into hip hop music. I've even, if you, if you, you can even look into, look up banda, banda hip hop. Have you guys ever heard banda hip hop? No. There's banda hip hop. So. I have a friend right now uh, who he made a beat. He took a Vicente Fernandez uh, mariachi song and he turned it into a really cool beat. Like I'm gonna 
definitely write to that. I want to put together a song on that, like mariachi. I want to do like, um, like a Mexican power uh, part two. There was a song called Mexican Power by a group called Proper Dose. Proper Dose actually uh, is a childhood friend of mine. So Ernie G and Frank V, they were kids I grew up with in the neighborhood. Like when we started doing hip hop music, uh, Ernie G got more serious into it and he actually got signed. So there's a group called Proper Dose. They have a song called Mexican Power. Um, and so I want to do a, a sequel to that, a part two with all the stuff that's going on now with Trump and all that kind of thing. And uh, so, uh, I, and I'll end with this. I'll, uh, this is my latest stuff that I'm working on. So I'm, I'm working on these lyrics and it goes like this. It goes, um, get back, step back, give me six feet of that social distance. F that, I'm leading the resistance. Corporations, they want to enslave us. Republicans and Democrats ain't going to save us. Anyway, I, I, I will run out of time. When I finish the whole song, I'll come and perform it live in your class. So with that, thank you all very much. Uh, I got to run because I'm running for city council. I really appreciate you all. Uh, those of you who want to volunteer, I put it in the chat. Um, you, you can hit us up. Let us know if uh, you have some time. You can do phone banking from your home. We'll give you the list. You guys can call the script. It's real easy. And uh, well, before I go, any questions, I guess, Veronica? Yeah, yeah. If somebody, before he goes, now's your chance. If you have any questions or comments, please. How is so, it? Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. You can go ahead. No, you can go. Yeah. Oh, it's because I was curious, like, where Ska would fit in. Because, like, Ska is also a Latino thing. Like, yeah, what are the foundations of it? Yeah, I haven't heard too much uh, in terms of Ska, it, even though in my neighborhood, like, there was. You know, there's a band called Suicidal Tendencies. Anybody's ever heard of like a rock band or a punk band? I think they're a punk or whatever. Yeah. Okay, they're well, punk. Edgar, uh, uh, Carlos Edgar, he was the first Chicano, the first the first drummer for Suicidal Tendencies was a Chicano kid here from Santa Monica. And uh, they were like band in Santa Monica, but uh, they started doing like ska and stuff like that. I just, it, it, it was a, you know, hip hop became much more popular and kids got into it because of the break dancing, the house parties, you know, like ska and, and other, other forms, you know, it was a little bit more complicated. It was, you know, to, to dance to and so forth, you know what I'm saying? So it wasn't, it, it didn't, it didn't take off the same way, you know, but for the Latino community, for Chicanos, especially uh, in Los Angeles, I mean, of course we have like Kid Frost, uh, Lighter Shade of Brown, like some of the new, the, the newer um, or the first sort of like Latino hip hop bands, you know, were, were, were uh, rapping about a lot of what, what was going on in the neighborhood, but they were also trying to, you know, uh, go mainstream. They're trying to get record deals, you know? But some of the people that, you know, that, that, you, that, are, that are more popular for me that I like, like the old school rappers, you don't really hear too much about. They don't make it, you know, they don't get signed. So it's, it's a lot in the underground where you hear some of the best like Chicano hip hop music, you know? Because think about it, who are the most like well-known Chicano Latino hip hop artists? You might, I, I would say what, like, uh, you know, uh, Cypress Hill, but they're, they're, they're Cubano, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're not, they're not even really Mexican, but still, in terms of the Latino community, they're kind of like the biggest known. Uh, other than that, there's not, you know, there's, there's a couple out there, you know, like that have one hit or whatever, just not so consistent, you know what I'm saying? So it's harder for us to, to, to know who those people are. But uh, any other questions before I go? Yeah, I do just want to mention that there are um, several other Chicana and Chicano uh, uh, hip hop artists out there. It's just, yeah, they're not mainstream. And I'm going to try to connect uh, with another group or two if we have time during the semester to expose you all to them because they're, they're, they're young, they're fly, they're, you yeah. know, rapping about um, uh, current political situations, they're all about cultura and identity and all that. So um, socially conscious. So that that's, I love that. Um, and, you know, I'm a little older, so I have to try to keep up. It takes extra work for me to try to keep up with all the youngins and see what's happening out there. Um, you know, so, but I did, I, I, there's some folks who have been introducing me and like, hey, have you heard of this? Have you heard of that? And so I, I wanna try to bring them to you all too. But Oscar, that's, that's so dope that you have done that for so long and that you can like show up and pop for us and, and rap for us. And then, okay, I'm gonna go run my campaign now. Like that's, <laughs> that's awesome, I love it. So you all know that this is a real one right here. Okay, so if there's anything you can do and spare a little bit of time to help them with that campaign, you know, that's a real one that's gonna represent our hint in a good way in a community in which we are highly, highly underrepresented and underserved. Okay, yes. so 
this is a way for us to do something about it. So thank you again, Edmano, wishing you the best of luck and students, please connect with Oscar. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And Veronica, one last thing I wanna say in, in closing. Yes. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King had a dream, right? Of all races coming together. And the only place that really I have seen like that dream realized is through hip hop culture. Like when you go, when I organize hip hop events at the youth center, there's black, there's Latinos, there's whites, there's Asians, there's rich, there's poor. Everybody comes together. Hip hop culture does not care if you're black or Latino or white or anything like that. If you have skills, if you're ready to go and dance or DJ or rap, you know, it's something that you do. And if you're ready to participate, it embraces all cultures. And so, um, you know, for me, it's really, it's been, it's been really, it saved my life. Hip hop was really a big part of my life. It still is today. It's, I have a youth center with a recording studio because of what hip hop culture did for me in my life as a, as a teenager. So uh, thank you all very much for paying attention and keep on getting hip and keep on hopping to action. Take that knowledge and do something with it. God bless you all. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay. Adios. Gracias. Okay, y'all. So um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Sireño here. Um, and there's one more speaker that I have that is trying to connect. And for some reason, he can't get in the class. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do that in the background, but let's go ahead and go with Sireño. Um, so Sireño Rodriguez is a retired professor from CSU Sacramento and UC Davis and Santa Barbara and Woodland Community College, former director of Casa de la Raza in Santa Barbara. And he was active during the Chicano movement, immigrated to the United States at the age of 14. Uh, Sireño Rodriguez and his family have worked in the fields every summer. So thank you so much for being here with us, Sireño. I met Sireño a number of years ago, just you know, going to uh, conferences that have a lot to do with Chicanos and Latinos in education. And so he's been a longtime educator and it's been my honor to have met him and to um, share and, and dialogue with him about um, the education of, of our gente and the movement of our gente and his involvement in the movement since way back and still, you know, luchando for us. So I appreciate you taking the time to be with us, Sireño. Um, I did email you back. I didn't get the link for the song. I got everything else except for that. If there's a way for you to drop the link right here in the chat, or you can try to email it to me again, but it's it's not there. Or if there's a, is it on YouTube? Because I can look it up. No, 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 it's not. Uh... Okay. Yeah, I checked my email again and I didn't see anything come through. Yeah, uh, I, I sent it to my Google Drive. Huh. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll be checking, but go ahead and get your conversation started. I'll, I'll, I'll check my drive right I, can, now to see. I can play it here through some other means, but anyway, well, we'll okay. see. if not, you can always play it at some point for the students. Absolutely. You know, I, yeah, well, gracias, you know, thank you very much for, for the invitation and what I want to do is I want to share with the students in a very brief period of time a very rich cultural tradition in, in the Mexicana community of uh, music, poetry, folklore, oral history. Uh, but I will concentrate or at the end of it, I will talk about an aspect of folklore, music and poetry and political activism uh, in Ventura County uh, dealing with uh, Union Campesinos and, and uh, what happened there in, in the 1970s. And uh, that resulted in, in a uh, record that we uh, taped in La Casa de la Raza in 1980 called Canciones and Corridos de Aztlán. And it actually was also published into a, a, a little book that was published by La Casa de la Raza Journal of the 1970s and 80s called Shalman. So I send you that in my first um, email, and it's a whole, you know, book then that you may be able to to share with the students or or have them read part of it, that part of the corrido that deals with Ventura County. But anyway, before I get into deep into the into the corrido thing, I wanted to also give you a little brief history of uh, of Mexican uh, the history of Mexican music. And you know, dating back to more than a thousand years before any of the Europeans came here, our native ancestors had practiced uh, poetry, music, dance, and certainly in, in the Valley of Mexico through Floricanto, uh, that uh, you know the Nahuatl poetry and music, and there's a big tradition. And people are still doing it. 
but with the arrival of the Spaniards, you know, they brought their, their own music, they brought their own customs, their, you know, that, that uh, influenced what was going on and what happened in Mexico in future years. But the Spaniards brought the, the seguidillas, the fandango, zapateados, romances in terms of the music, but also in terms of, of poetry, they brought the, the, the whole uh, concept of decimas. And decimas, you know, I, I, I say that uh, los decimeros, these are the people that still practice uh, performing poetry, you know, were the old rappers, you know, in, in villages in Michoacan and throughout uh, South and Central America, the Spanish speaking world, uh, there is a, uh, there is a, a tradition of decimeros, you know, that, that compose poetry that are, that it's, that it's localized and that it's uh, new uh, at the moment. And then there are competitions of, of decimeros. And I know in my village, you know, my grandpa was one of the decimeros and they would ask him to compose poetry al instante. They gave him a topic and right there and then he, he composed a poem. But anyway, uh, the, the Spanish brought those type of things and the, we in our communities, uh, adapted it and, and worked on it and made it even better. Uh, when the Spaniards came years later, the whole tradition of, of song and poetry and music continue uh, during the colonial times uh, by uh, Mexicano natives and it's called Cantares Mexicanos. And there, there are several books by Miguel Leon Portilla you know, that, that uh, has uh, documented that here's one of the books on Cantares Mexicanos. Uh, but the, uh, the Europeans, you know, brought in uh, their, 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 their music, uh, like I said, fandangos, zapateados, y romances. And, uh, but other Europeans also came in and also influenced Mexican music, like uh, the, the waltz, you know, sobre las olas, there's a very popular, very important valse um, mexicano uh, sobre las olas. But, you know, it's the European influence. El Chotis and the German immigrants brought in uh, the music like the polcas, redobas, and so on and so forth that are played in the northern part of Mexico and they influence the norteño type of music. Uh, in Mexico, and especially the the uh, the seguidillas, fandangos, y zapateados uh, were transformed and in, and in, into in jarabes, como el jarabe tapatío, maybe you know it, jaranas, guapangos, sones, gatos, and so on and so forth. And uh, the romances uh, uh, influence also the 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 creation of uh, what is uh, we know as corridos, you know. Uh, that I'll be talking about it later on. Now, Mexico has a very rich tradition in terms of its music development, but the, the, the Musica Mexicana, it's, 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 it's uh, there, there are many, many styles, you know, uh, there is rancheras, and there is sones, uh, the son is, is, a, is a combination or influenced by Spanish, uh, African, and native. And uh, it varies the style of, of those type of music of the son is varied from region to region. We have the son Jarocho, the son uh, <clears throat> Jalisciense, the son Huasteco, the son Calentano, son Michoacano, so on and so forth. And the ranchera derived itself and was an outgrowth of the son Jalisciense, which is uh, a type of Mexican song that is performed in the ranchos, in the rural areas. This is what is called uh, the uh, ranchera. And uh, then we have the corrido. Now the corrido, and this is where I'm gonna be talking a little bit more, is, uh, is a type of uh, uh, a narrative. It's poetry accompanied by music. And it tells stories. The themes of the corridos are very varied. You know, they include héroes, mujeres, caballos, other animals, events, accidents, 
you name it, a corrido, it, it, it's a very uh, easy way, I guess, of people documenting what happens in a certain community when a certain event takes place. And uh, they're corridistas, just like there are raperos, you know, uh, and other musicians that that uh, that that perform those type of, uh, of, of canciones. And the corrido can be accompanied by the Mexican um, musical groups such as mariachi, norteños, bandas, jarocho, marimbas, trios. Doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, but the the corrido is is a very pliable uh, style of type of music that. Uh, they can be played almost by any by any group, but the corrido it tells a story, and there is a structure, there is a form, you know, that I'm not going to get into it, other than to say that it's it's a very uh, uh, strong tradition of Mexican music and in our communities, and I knew that, you know, I I, I study the corrido uh, as a student at the university, but I also had experiences in my own communities wherever some an event took place, uh, somebody would write a corrido. Uh, but those corridos never made it into the public eye. I mean, it was something that was shared among the familias. And uh, I I've, uh, I was working in Ventura in Santa Paula, organizing farm workers in the, the 1970s, 1973, 74. Uh, and uh, I noticed that some of the, the, as I met with the campesinos that, you know, they would sing their corridos and, you know, something that they never shared with anybody else. But I also became aware that in Oxnard, which I think this you know, is pretty close to you guys, uh, there was a, 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 a programa de aficionados on Sundays that was uh, broadcast live by the Spanish speaking radio station. It's like a talent search. And, Every Saturday, every Sunday afternoon, there was a Dia de Aficionados and people would come and perform. You know, they would sing canciones and so on and so forth. So I had an idea when I was working at La Casa de la Raza in 1978, 79, is to, to I approached the radio station and I asked them if, uh, if it was possible for them to dedicate a series of Dia de Aficionados on Sundays to corridos. And I said, you know, Let's ask the Mexicano community to come and perform the non-published, non-recorded corridos on the radio. So they did, and we had a, a great response, and we were able to collect about, you know, after about two, three months of aficionados singing corridos and other music as well, not only rancheras, you know. Uh, we, we, we collected about 34, 35 diferentes corridos, and, I, we asked the corridistas to, to, if they wanted to participate, to put it in writing. And then I promised them, I made the commitment that I would seek funding from whatever source I could to record it and to publish it. And I was able to get some money from the National Council of, excuse me, uh, uh, the California Council of the Arts and the, and the National Endowment of the Arts in, uh, in, in Washington and also some local funding from Santa Barbara and I was able to hire somebody that that took responsibility to help me coordinate it and get it going and it resulted in in a book that you have and also the record uh, that that we have uh, the 10 songs we we selected the best 10 songs and uh, one of the uh, one of the things that we were benefited it was the fact that uh, Hi. connected to you there. At the University of California in Santa Barbara, there was a uh, faculty member, there was a, um, a scholar by the name of Luis Leal, which in the academic world of Chicano studies and Chicano literature, he is the dean of Chicano literature. He is, you know, el, el señor who's there, a scholar who's way up there, I mean, internationally recognized. And he, he was in Santa Barbara, so I asked him, you know, uh, would you do us a favor and do an, an, uh, an introduction to Shalman, the publication of the Corridos, and he did. So what you have in the Shalman Canciones y Corridos de Estran that I share with you is uh, an introduction, both in English and Spanish, by Don Luis Leal, you know, the, the, the Chingon scholar of, in our community. And uh, now, in the 1970s, mid 1970s, 
the union, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta Union came into Ventura to organize campesinos. And they began to organize campesinos in all of Ventura County. And uh, so some of the corridos that you find in the publication that I send you are corridos about Rancho Cespe, La Limonera, uh, uh, Moore Park, X City, uh, that, that people went into strike. In Rancho Cespe, unfortunately, there was, a, there was an accident. The, and, and this is the corrido that I'm trying to play. Uh, there are two corridos in, in the publication of Rancho Cespe, but one of them uh, you know, talks about the union coming in. And because the campesinos wanted to join the union, the rancheros kicked the campesinos out of the housing. And un señor, about 65, 67, you know, a senior citizen campesino decided to take some action to uh, uh, protest on this illegal eviction of the campesinos. He poured gasoline on his body and he burned himself. Wow. You know, so uh, I'm gonna try to see if I can play this, this uh, I have a, a record, I mean, here uh, that I sent to you. I'm uh, downloading it into my telephone and hopefully it will pass on. And then, you know, see, Daniel, you can also share from your from your computer directly um, if you wanted to just play that. Because uh, at the bottom here, if you wave your little cursor, it's going to say, say share screen. If you have that song on your computer and you can just have it up already. So when you click on share screen, you'll see it pop up, but you have to have it open first. Yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can find it in here. And then yeah. students um, in the chat, I did attach the PDF of the book that he's referring to, Corridos y Canciones de Aslan. And so just also remember that Aslan um, was a very important term that was used during the 60s and 70s that gave Chicanos and Chicanas at the time um, more identity and relationship with the land of the Southwest, right? Where, where that is our ancestral land, where our ancestors from way back um, first lived in the Southwest of, the, of what today is the United States and then migrated South into the Central Valley of Mexico where they established the Tenochtitlan, right? So the immigration patterns actually started from North to South now they're more south to north, but originally they were from uh, north to south. And so, um, and also a word on the uh, corridos is that that was a way for like at a very grassroots community level of being able to document what was going on at the time. Like what anything that was happening, the person, the date, what happened first, second, third, you know, and that was our way of documenting um, history and what was happening at the time because we didn't have access to the news channels or to um, or to, uh, to universities as much as other folks did. And so being the creative and resourceful, resourceful people that we are, we did that through music, through art, through all kinds of stuff. And so Corridos is really a, a testament to our people's resilience and finding creative ways to document our history and our experiences. I'm trying to find it here and I can find it in here. <laughs> okay, no uh, worries. Does anyone have any questions for um, Sireño in the meanwhile? How many of you grew up listening to corridos in your homes? And I'm not talking narco corridos, those are different. <laughs> <laughs> and they're similar in a way, right? Where in narco corridos, they're still talking well, about specific people yeah. that are happening, the, the, right? The corridos right? cover many things, you know, oh, and one of the things that the corridos covered is also uh, the narco corridos. Unfortunately, you know, they're very detrimental to our community because it, it, it produces things that we don't want, but it is part of the, of the corrido tradition. Uh, some of them that is not what we really want to. Uh, but the, uh, the corrido that, that um, or the, the, the themes that became the most popular and those that have been written the most are, are about the revolution as well. I don't have it, it's not there, it's not pain. I have one, but it's not the one. Okay, hold on. 
There it is. Can you hear it? This is the Rancho Cespe. You know, I mean, I know it's a very brief, you know, I, I, I usually teach a class on El Corrido, you know, and it's 18 or weeks or whatever it is at the community college or at the university. I, I started teaching the Corrido uh, in the 1980s, no, actually 70s, <laughs> oh, my God, that long ago. <laughs> I was teaching, I was in a graduate program at doctoral program in Santa Barbara and and I, I taught part-time in Chicano studies in 76 through 81. So one of them was the Corrido. Oh, that's awesome. Any questions, comments? Uh, I kind of grew up with more cumbias, which is kind of like more Central South American. But I was curious to be about like how that one came to be, like how cumbias came well, to be. Cumbia, La cumbia came out of, uh, 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 from the slaves in Colombia. Negros, you know, they, they are African brothers in Colombia, and the cumbia started it in Colombia. And then in the 1960s, 
uh, it was brought into Mexico and uh, there was a, a, a rock and roll kind of group in Mexico City uh, uh, that Los Cometas, you know, Mickey Laure and Los Cometas in the 1960s popularized Colombia and Mexicanized it in a sense, you know, and it became very, very popular and, and, and still popular, you know, but it, it's a Colombian uh, influenced by the African slaves in Colombia. And then in case uh, y'all didn't catch it, so the song was talking about, like, if you notice at the very beginning, they give a date, right? So it was 1979 on the 16th of January. And then they go in to what happened, you know, as far as um, them being exploited by the owners of Rancho Ceste and all the, you know, the struggle that was going on. And so everything is very factual and um, told in the order of, of the events. So that's a very um, traditional part of a corrido. And, and to me, I, I've always been fascinated how corridos have been used to document history, right? Because when people think about documenting history, um, you know, we normally think of, of books, right? Just like writing it in books and then maybe oral tradition, right? Uh, but it's, it's uh, we don't typically think of documenting history in music and songs, right? Um, not to this extent where it gives the dates, the names and everything in, in um, chronological order. So I really, um, that's always fascinated me about corridos and I just, cause I just love how creative our people are and how resourceful uh, we've always been. So any well, other you. questions or comments for Sireño? I was going to say, you know, the corrido has a, has the, uh, there's it's a very structured form, you know, and it starts with introducing the date or the authors, and then it ends up with a despedida, as you saw it in there too, you know. But this is a very traditional corrido. The, the person who composed it was not an academic, you know, but was someone who listened to the corridos and knew the structure and the form, and he followed it a formula and, and he brought in all the dates and, and he told a story that's very complex in, in a very short period of time in three minutes. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I wanted to touch that on that. Like, I believe like in art is a way of like interpretation of many ways because we can relate that to cave in time because they used art paintings to express themselves with what's going on. And I mean, there's still today that people go to them and look at the paintings to see the part of history, how we became who we are now. And that's something that's amazing how music can, like art and music can just stick with someone and it can make a movement and how music is everything to people and how it can make people come together. Yeah, and it's been part of our experience, you know, for thousands of years. You know. yep. Well put, well put. Okay, y'all, so in the interest of time, thank you so much again, Sireño, for being with us and for sharing your experiences with us and your knowledge with us. Muchisimas gracias. Um, please, you're welcome to stick around if you want to. Um, I, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our next guest speaker. Um, Jose Cano is the second child of immigrant parents from Jalisco, Mexico. Jose was born and raised in Oxnard, California. He is a founding member of the East LA band Las Cafeteras and has toured extensively over the last 10 years all over the US and Canada, as well as several other countries abroad. He first started playing music in, in the middle school concert band. His first drum kit came in high school after watching some friends play at a family party. And it's been all about holding down the beat ever since. Afrobeat, reggae, funk, R&B are some of his main rhythm and drumming influences. Jose holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from California State University, Los Angeles. Before dedicating himself to music full time, he worked as a freelance design engineer while attempting to start several businesses. Some worked, most didn't, until finally the right opportunity came. Sustainable living, the Dharma, running, biking, swimming in the ocean, Boxing, community, art, and culture are among some of his passions. Jose currently owns and operates his own recording studio in Oxnard and is more active than ever writing and recording music. Hermano, welcome. I'm so <laughs> happy that you could join us on that. 
navigated those technical difficulties. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you for being with us. Yes, for sure, Beto. Thank you for the invite. Um, I'm glad that we got through the technical difficulties. Uh, Sireño, thank you for all that you shared. It's, uh, it's good to hear all of that stuff, uh, a lot of stuff that I'm very unaware of, so it's, it's nice to hear it. Um, and hello, students. Um, I know y'all are, are going through the whole COVID uh, school experience, so um, I know that must be tough, but you know, thank you for persevering. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to be here with y'all. My name is Jose. Um, just I, I'm, a, I'm a, just a dude, boy from Oxnard, raised from Mexican parents. And um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've known Beto for some years now, and we kind of met around a lot of the stuff that we were doing with the arts. Um, and obviously, my, my art is, uh, my primary art is, is music. Um, and so I've been playing music my, you know, my whole life. Uh, since I was a teenager and um, I never did it for fun like I never did it to try and like be a professional musician or anything like that I just was really having fun with it um, you know fast forward many years I played in like a couple bands and just I played in junior high and I'm a part of a band called Las Cafeteras and so we're a band out of uh, East Los Angeles and uh, we've been playing we've been together for about maybe 13 years and um, we started as a very like, very like community based, super local grassroots um, organization. We were just actually like a group of students um, who played, who, who, who um, there was a community center in the community of East uh, of El Sereno called the Eastside Cafe. And it was like an autonomous Zapatista inspired um, community run um, space. And so out of that space, there was um, some classes. Somebody wanted it, like somebody was giving free Son Jarocho classes. Um, and maybe folks, maybe some folks are familiar with Jarocho, maybe some are not, but just um, a, a really short kind of like description of it is very communal, um, is very communal uh, way of sharing music, sharing some traditional songs. Um, and it's, it's sort of primary like manifestation of this music is the fandango. And it's kind of like, there's a big circle and everybody's welcome to play. You're welcome to sing. You're welcome to dance. There's a couple rules that you need to follow, but it's inclusive. You don't have to be like a you know a, a really like superstar musician to participate. And I think that's what really like invited a lot of people to participate in the fandango and to learn harocho. Um, maybe it was probably about like maybe 10, 15 years ago when it started. At least from my knowledge where uh, Jarocho music started to get really popular, like in, in the LA area, some parts of Orange County and in different cities around the US. And, um, and, uh, and it was cool, you know, it, it's very participatory. And really that's kind of what brought so many of us together and um, started Las Cafeteras. Um, we initially would get invited to play you know, coffee shops, local fundraisers. We'd kind of like bounce, like in the same day, we'd play one fundraiser in this part of town, then we'd go and we'd play another fundraiser in another part of town. And that's really like kind of a lot of what we did. And it was really fun and we did it because it was beautiful. Um, and before we were, um, I guess maybe some, one of the things that Las Cafeteras is known for is we have like a very like community, social justice, um, feminist message where, um, We've, 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 you know, at one point, uh, four active members, but we travel in six or seven people anyways, but we've always had a strong, like, um, feminine, like female lead singers. Um, and, uh, it's something that we've always sort of em embraced, um, before we were, I mean, people call us, a, 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 a often call us like a political band um they might put us in that category and for us it's really we're just kind of sharing stories you know like a lot of the times when we talk about um immigration or like my my parents my uncles having to cross the border illegally to work here send money back home um and you know being in fear of being deported like to us that's not political to us that's like life that's a story and um, 
and it's doing the importance of sharing our stories. I'm gonna backtrack a little bit, like before we spe even became a band, before we ever started playing music together, we were all just a bunch of like, you know, individuals. We all like went to college for different, different things. We were all like very involved, sort of like political in, in different political social justice organizations and community spaces, like independently. We were the ones that like protest, just like so many other people. And so like that sort of spirit of like the La Lucha, you know, it, 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 you know, naturally just kind of manifested itself in our music. Um, so we didn't, we don't really see ourselves as a, you know, as a political band. Um, we're a band that we just like to share stories of our people, of our community, of so many of the struggles that like our parents, maybe your parents, our family members, our collective, like bigger community have gone through. Um, so that's kind of like in a nutshell, that's kind of who we are. Um, we started like traveling and touring many years ago um, because, but because we always had like an organ, like a community organizer, social justice background, we were also able to like give workshops in what we were doing. Like people were very curious about, um, you know, the music, the performance, but also like what we were about. And so we were able to like take advantage of, of that and do like a lot of workshops in colleges and universities all over the country. Um, and, you know, there is like a, People are very curious about, um, about kind of just finding out like what our story was. And I think there's something about being able to share music and you have a collective experience with people that you don't know, then somehow it allows people to, to, to let their guard down and to really like open up their hearts. Um, so we've found that like, we've been lucky enough to where we've, we've been able to go many places with, you know, generally speaking, the audiences that we play to are mainly white audiences. And we've gone, we've gone to almost every state in the US. We've gone to like 45 out of the 50 states. Wow. And uh, we play in a lot of very rural places, very like conservative states all over the place really. And we've never like, I mean, I could probably count on one hand, like the bad experiences that we've had or like where somebody has not received us well or any sort of hostility. And I believe that that's because of the music, because of what music does and how we're able to connect and really like speak to each other as, as people. Um, but um, yes, um, what else am I gonna say? I'm not used to giving presentations, but uh, it's nice to be here with y'all. <laughs> Should we show a couple of videos? Yeah, let's show. Do you have those links, Vero? Um, I can just look it up on, on YouTube real quick. I have my YouTube up, so okay. is there a particular... I know I want to show like it's movement time. I, I want to show that one for sure, but if there's another one that you feel like um, embraces the, the Son Jarocho a little bit more, um, but whatever you want. There was this one video that I think is really cool. It's uh, Mujer Soy. It's the it's the the remix version, and uh, Mujer Soy is uh, Denise, who's the singer in the band, uh, the the woman singer in the band. Um, she wrote this song, and it sort of the video sort of shows the life of of Marianne Aguirre. She's like the she's part of Ovarian Cycles, this, this uh, women's bike collective in LA. She's part of, she's a DJ. She's part of the Chulita Vinyl Club. So she's, she does a lot of really cool things. She was a really young mom. And so there was this sort of narrative of oftentimes of young moms of like what happens to their lives once they become young parents. Um, you know, a lot of times it's like, oh man, your life is over, you messed up. But the video kind of like shows her doing really cool things and like in an empowering way. Um, so maybe we could see that video. There okay. we go. Did it again. Hold up. I keep uh -huh. getting a click on the sound. Oh, there it is. Okay. I did have it. Here we go.
or comments for Jose on that one? I just want to show, sorry, I just wanted to say that I saw like one of the women like holding a sign that said decolonize our bodies. And I just really liked 
like that specific phrase and it was really good i really liked it mm. cool thank you thank you yeah one of the things that i know um that we're really big on in las cafeteras is um is is storytelling and and telling our stories and we all come from like different backgrounds and we have different things that we're into we're different people and a lot of the times there's really big like misunderstandings in terms of like how we perceive each other, how we experience each other and like the conclusions that we draw about, about different communities. Um, so for us, like uh, through music, um, we, are, uh, we are storytellers. We, we tell stories and we totally promote um, very active story sharing as well as story listening. And it's, it's totally tied into, it's totally the same as like what um, Sireño talked about with the corridos. It's another way of documenting um, stories. And so really it's all related. That's really just what we do. We tell stories. Um, and that kind of sign is another way of, of, of also telling a story. So I'm glad you like that. Anyone else, like, was there a particular scene or um, imagery or messaging from that video that hit home for you? Um, I like the part like in the beginning where it's like showing like just a normal mom like doing her own thing and then it escalates into like her own story and then talking about political views and stuff as well. Like I feel like that's really empowering to see that as a woman myself, like thinking about like my mom when she was younger, like when people thought like oh, she's a single mom, she's not gonna get anywhere, you know? But my mom's raised three brilliant children. Both of her children went to college. My sister's an esthetician, he, she has a great job. And like, it, it just proves the fact that people judge more than they look. So, and then you showing that message at the end, it shows like, we should look into people more. We should feel more, not really just look. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful, Taya. And, and I related to what you just said right now, too, in that um, the stories of our mothers often aren't told. Um, they're often in the shadows of so many other groups of people as women of color. Uh, and, you know, my, my mother being an immigrant monolingual Spanish speaking mom and also a single mom of six children somehow was able to raise us and make sure that we we were you know, in a, in a good place in our own lives, right? Like there, the, the fact that I was even able to graduate from a university and then become a professor, like that was, that's a really big deal, right? Because my mom is, did not, um, she worked for that for us, but I think that it's, it still surprised her like, oh my goodness, like this came from me, right? And my, and my brother, my siblings are all, you know, all have good stable careers as well. But my mom at the same time, and just watching this video reminded me of her because you see this single mom like taking care of her, her semilla, her baby, and then going off and being active in her community as my mother was. She was very active in the UFW, right? And I remember going to UFW meetings with her when I was little. And so that stayed with me, it obviously made an impact on me um, because here I am an activist, right? So, so she did all of that, fighting in the struggle, being part of La Lucha and then going back home after all those meetings and then feeding all of us and then waking up early in the morning to go be a farm worker again. And that was like her routine. So those stories definitely need to be told. And I appreciate that y'all did that um, and that you do that on a regular basis as Las Cafeteras. I really appreciate that. Um, any other comments or questions? I do want to show one more video. Is that okay with y'all? Okay. This is one of my favorites just because I always show it in like um, trainings for ethnic studies teachers and for like <laughs> students and whatnot. So you got to relay, relay that message to your compañeros. Oh, hold up, hold up. Could I say Any something? Buttons? Okay, here we go. That's not what I want. Do y'all see that? Somebody say yes, because I can't see anybody's faces right now. Can you see the video? Yes. Okay. Your history books got it all wrong, so I come to you with a song. In 1810, con el gran grito de pasión, se levantaron con razón. 
black and brown fighting together on the day I'll always remember. And El Cinco de Mayo con el Grito de Gallo, black, white, and brown bleeding together on the day I'll always remember. Because really, it hasn't been that long, so just in case Cat Williams had you guessing, let me kick y'all down with a little history lesson. In the 19th century, while the U.S. promoted degradation, annihilation with its military U.S. Navy, Mexico got rid of the caste system, voted for its first indigenous president, even getting rid of legalized slavery. The Underground Railroad also ran south, which led black folks to freedom, with Mexico right there to receive them. Mexican men with Pancho Villa and Zapata fighting for tierra, libertad y techo with Adelitas on the front line with bullets across their pecho. In the year 1946, it was the Mendez family that fought against segregation in schools. Because before that, they treated us like fools, pushing us out into gangs, wars, and drugs. And then they get pissed off at us when we become crips and bloods, traviesos, zutsuras, pachucos, folkloristas, punks, bomberas, haraneras in the heat, haraneras with the bomb as beats, talking about what's really going on in the streets. In the 60s, in the streets of Oakland, California, Black Panthers organized for answers. Young lords in New York fought against wars. The Stonewall Rebellion remained true for the rights of the LGBTQ. AIM, who was down for native rights with no shame in their game. Brown berets in LA learning how to fight and doing what's right. In the campos of California, Filipinos were the first ones to lay down the boycott. Screaming in solidarity, Isang Baksak, one rise, one fall. You come for one, you come for all. And today, Arizona and Alabama, they don't play. Carving out racist laws like it's made out of clay. I stand with Emmett, Trayvon, Oscar, and Bell. With my mentor, Mumia, up in the cell. Telling you I'd rather be blind than to stay quiet on a day where my people are hunt down like prey. My ability to breathe is directly connected to my ability to see. It's not about me, never was, never will be. It's about we. It's time to move, y'all. My people. It's movement time. Very good. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Um, Ridlene, why don't you go ahead and say that out loud? Let's hear your voice, your powerful voice. I was just going to say that I related to what the both of you guys said about single mothers. And um, I really like the element of how fast paced it was in the first video that we saw and how throughout it all, she was still, you know, tapping her foot and smiling and getting everything done, even though it was like back to back. And that's something that um, a lot of women have to do. And if we do anything else, we're considered bitchy. And people don't really look at things from our perspective of how many things we could be facing. And we just take it all with a smile. Thank and then I, I also really like that line too that Ty just typed out. It's not about me, it's about we. I love it, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that line. Like that's something that I can really relate to like I feel like a lot of more like artists need to start saying that because they say it's not about them but then they make the situation about them so what's the new solution we need to start thinking about we not me and I, that was just like I loved it I just yeah it really <laughs> got to me I was like yes someone said it <laughs> <laughs> And the other thing I love about that video and the lyrics is that it goes across all these lines, right? So they're talking about black and brown, they're talking about LGBTQ, they're talking about like women's rights, they're talking about like everything, like AIM, the American Indian movement, like they're bringing the fact that we're all struggling, right? And that we need, we have come together and that we need to continue to come together, right? And like, uh, uh, you know, get over those barriers that are dividing us because we're all dealing with the same thing. So I, I absolutely love that. And, and we do, we, we need to unite with 
um, people that are like-minded and that are about social justice, um, regardless of their background. You know, if, if it's about social justice, then we should be united. Um, so I, I appreciate that. Um, any yeah. last words, Jose? Because we're actually over time. So I just want to allow you to close with any words if you want to. Oh, yeah, no, I think just kind of like what, what some of what folks said, I think, I think a lot of the times it's about changing the narrative. Um, and if we could change the narrative, we, if we could change those stories about each other, about like to really under, it, it helps us really understand each other. And that's really how we change the game. Um, that's why I like sharing and listening is so, so valuable. And you should all like, we should all continue to do it as much as we can. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for, for being here. Uh, I was happy to share with you all. All right, y'all. So make sure that you look up Las Cafeteras. They have a ton of amazing songs. So look them up. Their videos are dope, as you can see, um, and expand your horizon when it comes to music. OK, and of <laughs> course, thank you again, Sireño, for um, the history behind Corridos in like Ventura County, Santa Barbara, Rancho Ceste. Like that's home, you know, and these things have been going on for a long time. Thank you for being part of that movement as well. So if you all want to go ahead and unmute yourselves to give your thanks and your goodbyes, and then um, gentlemen, please stay online with me. And everybody else, go ahead and um, se despiden, por favor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.